How are y'all this morning? Hang on. Oh, hang on. Oh, I've been, oh, we have to stop for a minute. Pastor Barry, it's good to see you, sir. Sorry, I'm moving a little slow today. <laughs> Step up here, Patrick. Oh, okay, sorry. There you go. <laughs> I just wanted to say how proud I am of Pastor Patrick and his family. Nate's down there, Cody's somewhere, Chloe. And... <laughs> I to... want to thank you so much for your time. The last two and a half years pastoring here, uh, working with our youth, and uh, I'm so proud that you, you, you're taking a step. He's getting a promotion, right? Isn't that great? <laughs> Today is, is not his last Sunday with us. His last Sunday will be October the 20th, and, uh, and so uh, we're not going to make him speak that day because he'll be so overwhelmed with emotion that he probably won't even be able to communicate. <laughs> So uh, since I had kidney surgery this last week, I asked him to step up for me and speak. And so this is, even though it's not his last Sunday, it's his farewell message. And so if you've appreciated his ministry and his wife's ministry among us, will you just give him one more? Once again, we're going to give you an opportunity to bless him before he leaves, so keep that in mind, too, uh, with, with a, a gift. And so, Pastor Patrick, uh, I think I know what's on your heart today. Uh, go get him. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Barry. All right. Um, wow. I don't really know what to say. I apologize. I, that's normally not the case. Usually, I have more to say than I have time to say. Um, <laughs> I want to let you know it's been, a, uh, it's been an interesting time of trying to prepare for this message because when Pastor Barry approached me and said, hey, would you be willing to step in and preach? I'm having kidney surgery. I said, oh, yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, but I don't think at the time I understood exactly what he was asking me to do. Um, and I love the Word of God, and I love the privilege and the honor to be able to preach it. Um, but it's a difficult thing to be able to try to sum up uh, what I feel like God has spoken to me for you for this week as well as try to figure out what has God been telling me for the last two and a half years. And so it's a, it's a little bit of a sobering um, moment because you have to kind of encapsulate everything. And so I want to be able to give you uh, an encouraging message uh, as my family and I prepare to move on to our next ministry assignment in Colorado um, and as I prayed on what to share with you, I kept having the same thought kind of return over and over again. And if you, if you spend time in, in the presence of God, if you spend time with the Word, and, and you realize that in the Word, God repeats things as a way of getting your attention, right? As a way of helping you to remember them. And so I'm, I, I'm not super duper smart. And so, of course, as I feel like he's saying the same thing and I'm seeing the same thing, I'm not catching it. Oh, okay, I should probably should probably pay attention to the fact that this thought keeps recurring in my head. Um, and so I prayed more on that thought, and this is what came from the discussion with the Lord that I had had. For the last uh, two years and seven months, you and your young people uh, have heard me teach on things like displaying the gospel through relationships, your personal responsibility to be a testimony to the goodness and glory of God um, to the people around you, embracing the mind of Christ that trusts God and displaces fear. And it, it's been sermons on how to love one another and the importance of staying connected as the, as the body of Christ. And most of all, it's this dependency that we should place only in Jesus. Um, you know, we just sing it. I have a hard time with it because it's like I didn't realize that I can no longer sing this song without being extremely grateful and emotional. <laughs> so, um, but you know, the words just stick really, really true to me is that God's my firm foundation and he's the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. You know, so why would he fail? Why would he fail now? Um, and he won't. Sorry, usually I get more emotional towards the end of sermons, not at the beginning of them. So um, the first time I had the privilege to be able to share the word of God with you, uh, March of 2022, um, it was on certainty. It was on trusting the Lord in His sovereignty and His grace. 
And I'm certain of God's mercy and providence and everything that he's taken my family and I through. Uh, Every path that he's led me down, he's provided everything that we need. When we needed a place to live, he provided it. When we were lonely, he gave us you guys. And when I faced frustration and lack of understanding, God gave me mentors. You know, God gave me friends that would speak wisdom. And of that, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. So I examined those messages, um, which is another, like, really humbling thing to have to watch and listen to yourself. Like, oh my gosh, I've lost so much hair since I started here. Um, <laughs> No, it's, but I I examined those messages, and so I looked at what I felt like God has asked me to speak consistently and what He's asked me to do and live out as an example. And and here's what the Holy Spirit put on my heart. Throughout everything that I've tried to share, everything that I feel like God's spoken to me and hopefully through me, is this. And uh, again, my goal was to give you an encouraging message, and I, I, I believe that this will be it, so stick with me here when you hear this. The message I feel like God gave me that I've tried to live out in front of you, that I've tried to preach, be uncomfortable. Be uncomfortable. God created you for bigger things than a comfy seat and status quo. I feel like I've tried my best to continue to rely on God for the strength to do just this. To trust when it's not what I have planned, to move when it's inconvenient for me, and to run to challenges instead of running away from them. And it's that message that I think God wants me to share with you this morning. I don't think I know. I think it's actually what Jesus called us all to as we kind of look at our main text this morning. So, for the last time I get to ask you, or I get to tell you this, um, if you have your Bibles with you, you should. You always should. Would you stand with me this morning as as we read the main text? We stand because we hold the Bible as our highest standard of faith and conduct. We want to give honor to the Word of God. This is Matthew 16. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation, which is weird for me because I love the New International Version, but for some reason God's been doing something in me and this just speaks to me. Verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him. Catch that for just a minute. Peter began to reprimand Jesus for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Pray with me. Father God, I thank you right now for your word, Lord. I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us, encourages us. God gives us insight into what you've spoken to us. Lord, I pray right now that it is your word spoken, not mine. It's not my opinion, God. I pray that you would put me on like a piece of clothing, Lord, and you do the preaching this morning. God, I ask right now that you would bless every ear that hears this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat, please. Um, There's a lot happening in this really short conversation, right? And our main idea this morning, and hopefully, prayerfully, this is an encouragement to you, is that Christ is greater than comfort. And that sounds weird, because when we think of comfort in regards to Jesus, sometimes we see Jesus as, well, Jesus is my comfort. I'm not denying that, absolutely. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is that Christ is greater than the comfort that we seek sometimes. And that sometimes when we seek comfort because we hurt or because things are difficult, we don't immediately turn to Jesus as being above those things. We turn to things that are comfortable and then assume that that's what Jesus wants us to have. From our modern perspective, 
the word comfort is synonymous with convenience, enjoyment, happiness, luxury, pleasure, relief, satisfaction, and well-being. The strongest matches from the thesaurus will tell you that comfort is an idea close to abundance, cheer, peacefulness, plenty, and rest. But there's some additional words that show up in that list of synonyms that I think are a little disturbing, actually. It says that comfort is synonymous to complacency. That comfort is synonymous with sufficiency. And most of all, this doesn't sound like a threatening word, but I think we should be aware of it, is coziness. We all like being cozy, right? Like I've seen some of your fleece blankets on your couches. You like being cozy. But coziness is a little dangerous. I don't recognize any of these words necessarily as fruit of the Spirit. They don't show up in the list. And because they're not there, you shouldn't consider them fruit of the Spirit either. In fact, what we read in Matthew seems to give an indication that comfort is not something to be pursued. At least not in the way that we've been taught. Let's look at context here real quick, because if we don't have context, we can make the Bible say pretty much anything we want it to say. Context is important. Context is key. Jesus is having one of many confrontations that he's had, and he has them pretty often, with the religious leaders of the day. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, they're looking for signs from Jesus that he really is the Messiah. They want him to prove it. They're looking for what they deem as terms of success for Jesus, or from Jesus, rather. Jesus responds like he always does. He tells them the truth. Kind of tells them off just a little bit. And later he turns and he warns his disciples about the teachings of these Pharisees and about the Sadducees. In other words, you're not supposed to think like this. You should not give yourself over to their way of understanding. And Jesus actually gives them the alternative to what the Pharisees had proposed. He gives them the alternative in this conversation about who people claim that he is. You may remember this one. is that Peter makes the declaration when Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? They give the disciples give him a few answers, and Peter comes out and says, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God. And then Jesus blesses him for it, right? Some of you remember that. If you don't, it's, it's, it's all in here. It's all in Matthew. And what we see right after that is this conversation, our main text. We pick it back up here in verse 21. We're going to reread through this as we go. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. We shouldn't expect Jesus to tell us anything that is not accurate. Like Jesus is prophesying, he's foretelling what's going to happen. He's being very plain about it, right? The NLT says, again, that he said it plainly. And when we read the word necessary in here, when it's necessary that he go to Jerusalem and that necessary that he suffer all these things, it's imperative. It's going to happen. It's direction from the Lord that this is what will be. All these terrible things that Jesus is talking about must happen. I don't know that we want to talk about our own suffering sometimes so calmly. Like when we read that Jesus plainly told his disciples these things, like it's just matter of fact, guys. It's like this is what is going to happen. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to have horrible things done to me, and I'm going to die. And then I'm going to be raised to life again. Almost flippantly, right? Like it's, I, that's, that's a lot of heavy stuff to say in a very plain way of speaking. When you and I talk about the things that we go through, the challenges, the discomfort, the inconvenience, we don't tend to talk about it that plainly. Oh, I got cut off in traffic, and I hate that guy. And like the emotions rise to the surface, right? I stub my toe. Some of you all need to repent for stubbing your toes sometimes. <laughs> I think when we start talking about what is necessary for us to do in our lives to become obedient to Christ, we don't always say it with such trust and understanding. We hear discomfort or inconvenience, and we hear those things coming, and then we start to make choices. And Peter feels that. The guy that acknowledges the deity, the Godhood of Jesus, just proclaiming that he was Lord, understanding what Jesus has said, now says this, in verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him. 
Peter reprimands God. Like, I think you've heard me say this before. Like, Peter is a complete knucklehead. Like, that's why I love him. That's why we should all love him. Is like he represents the very, like, gut reaction in all of us sometimes. Peter literally reprimands, rebukes, tells God that ain't how it is. That's, um, that takes some guts. <laughs> Peter took him aside, began to reprimand him for saying these things. Heaven forbid, Lord, that will never happen to you. You're king, you're God, you do not have to deal with discomfort. You shouldn't even be thinking that it shouldn't be the easiest thing in the world. You could speak and everyone would bow. You could ask and the entire world would become yours. And that should sound familiar for just a second. Like, when, P when Jesus tells Peter, get behind me, Satan, it's because there's a very real similar conversation that Jesus has already had that looks exactly the same as this. Because Jesus goes off into the desert after being filled with the Holy Spirit, led into the desert and tempted for 40 days. Or, excuse me, fast for 40 days and then is tempted. By Satan. And so when you listen to Peter here, this almost sounds like prosperity preaching. It'll never be like that, Jesus. It'll only be sunshine and rainbows. It'll only ever be the sweetest thing ever. That will never happen. It's not going to be difficult. You won't endure hardship if you trust in the Lord. You won't get sick. You won't deal with difficult people. You won't get frustrated. You'll have everything you want. You won't need anything. You will have luxury and pleasure and comfort. And I think maybe the one of the things that I've tried to teach and live out is that there's blessing in following Jesus, but it's not easy and it's not comfortable. But it is what needs to happen. So Jesus now responds with his direction to Peter and to us as well. Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And here's point one. Comfort is a trap. Your convenience and your comfort are designed to trap you. When you see Jesus tempted in the desert in Matthew chapter 4, what does Satan offer him? Comfort. When Jesus is in physical pain, when he's starving, Satan offers comfort comfort. Make the rock turn to bread when offered an alternative path to success. Worship me and I'll give you the kingdoms, Satan says. Satan's alternative looks easier because Jesus, it's not like Jesus doesn't know what's coming for him. It would be much easier to say, man, it would be a lot easier if I just say this one thing to the enemy and all this becomes mine. Instead of having to go through a life where I'm mocked, ridiculed, beaten, spit on, killed, And when Satan tempts Jesus with safety, throw yourself off this temple. You won't get hurt. It's the comfort that becomes a temptation. Jesus repels and reprimands this mindset as a human point of view. It's a flesh perspective that is not of God. We have to view comfort as a trap. Now, I say that, and it's already unpopular. Like, wow, he picked this to talk about on his last Sunday that he's going to preach to us. It is vitally important that we understand the role of comfort in our lives. We're going to get to what real comfort is here at the end. But we have to acknowledge, first off, that when we seek comfort, sometimes we're not seeking it in the right place. And sometimes we're seeking it as an alternative to being obedient. And sometimes it becomes an excuse not to do things because it can't possibly be right if it's uncomfortable. We have to view comfort as a trap. There's a, um, there's a pastor, he, he, was a, he was a Lutheran minister in World War II. His name's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. He's a Lutheran pastor who was executed by Nazis three days before the end of World War II. And he put it this way. You want to talk about discomfort. And I think we have to look at it this way. When Jesus Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That does not sound super duper comfortable. 
Like, it's not a very, like, enticing invitation. Like, oftentimes, sometimes we sing about it this way, sometimes you've heard it explained this way, is that when Jesus calls you, he wants to wrap you in a warm embrace and all the troubles in your life just fade away at that point. Like, yeah, there is salvation from your sins. There is forgiveness in Jesus. There is eternal life that is given to you. But for now, it is not a stroll through a field of daisies. Which I don't know anybody that strolls through a field of daisies and feels like, like that's the thing that they're wanting most in life, but you get where I'm going with this. This pastor said, when Christ calls you, when you're called into following Jesus, when you become a disciple, when you placed all your hope and your trust and you accept and proclaim the lordship of Jesus, what you're really saying is, I'm off to die. I'm off into discomfort. I'm leaving what's comfortable here to go into what's better. It brings me into point two. What do we do if comfort's a trap? Real simple. Kill your comfort. It's a hard thing to accept, but it's, it's truth. If we as Christians become more concerned about what keeps us comfortable physically and maintaining a state of being that does not require us any discomfort to grow, then we have not made Christ our Lord. We've made comfort our God. You and I live in a world right now that is telling everyone, be comfortable, you do you, you got to love yourself, do whatever seems right to you, whatever your truth is, your truth, it's absolutely valid. We live in a world that says, never sacrifice your comfort or convenience. That's why you have Amazon two-day shipping. We can laugh about it. It's great. I love Amazon two-day shipping. It's like, oh, I forgot to do something. I got two days. Here we go. Maybe it'll get here tomorrow morning. But that's the flesh mentality. Jesus says that's not God's way of looking at things. That's man's way of looking at things. You're not looking at it from a heavenly perspective. You're looking at it from whatever your flesh wants. And if we know anything from the Word of God, there's not really a whole lot of great things that come out of acting out of our flesh. Comfort's a trap, so we have to kill it. We have to kill comfort. Now, does that mean... Well, Pastor Patrick, I guess I could put on a burlap sack and just wear that for the rest of my life. Does that mean that I have to just constantly be in agony? No, that's not what I'm saying. We're not talking about making yourself uncomfortable just to be uncomfortable, as if somehow that makes you holy. What I'm speaking on is this, is that when God calls you to do something, when you hear the Holy Spirit nudging you and saying, hey, you ought to go talk to that person, or hey, maybe you ought to be the first one to apologize, or hey, maybe you ought to put the technology down for a minute because what's going in here is not helping what's in here. When you have to step into that discomfort, that's where you have to go. We're urged by Jesus and later the Apostle Paul repetitively to die to ourselves so that we can gain in Christ what it is that we truly want. Galatians 2, verse 20 says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. This is Paul speaking. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The old self has been crucified. The desire to have all the pleasing, comfortable, convenient things in my life should have been nailed to the cross the minute that I accepted Jesus. And I should have understood that where Jesus calls me, there's going to be some pain involved in the growth it takes for me to be sanctified, set apart, and made into the image of Jesus. Transformation is not painless. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day, and I'm like, you know, one of the things that, that's there is like, I just can't get, I can't get this person to think the way that they should think. And I'm like, you know what's really helped me? Beating my head into a wall for years. And that sounds really unpleasant, right? Like, you, could just, you get the graphic, and it's just like, dun, dun, dun. And it's like, sometimes it feels like that. Sometimes we go through frustration and we go through challenges in life and we just feel like we're beating our head against a concrete wall. But you know what happens when we endure hardship like that? When we have to bounce up against God's will and justify ourselves into it? Is that, yeah, you know what? You beat your head into the wall long enough, things start to break. And things start to reform and they start to settle and they start to take the shape of the thing you're bumping up against. 
My wife and I served, she served 13 years, I served 12 years in the United States Air Force, and we talk about it now like it's a joke because it was really, really funny that we took it so seriously back when we started. But like we talk about basic training every once in a while, it'll come up. And it's like, what is the point of basic training? To get you to endure such discomfort that you start to literally break down so that you can be rebuilt. If you want to be rebuilt into the image of Christ, there's some breaking down that has to happen. How does it happen? God guides you by His Spirit into that which is uncomfortable. There is no growth without pain. you got to sacrifice something. Forgiveness is free. Growth costs. Jesus said this, back to Matthew. Then Jesus said to His disciples, If any of you wants to be My follower, you must give up your own way. That's important. Take up your cross. That's important. And follow me. Notice that there's a sequence to these things. He doesn't say, in order for you to be my disciple, you have to follow me first. And then maybe give up your own way. And I took the cross so you don't have to. Like, that's not what he said. He's very specific in his language. You have to deny yourself. You have to accept that what has been comfortable and convenient and status quo for you is not going to take you where I'm going to take you. You've got to take up your own cross. How many of you know like the cross is not a comfortable thing? Go watch The Passion of the Christ and tell me, does that look comfortable? What's the implication that Jesus is saying? It's going to hurt a little bit. Then you can follow. Verse 25, if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. To add to this, Luke's gospel includes this phrase in Luke 14. And if you don't carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So it's not even like it's just like, oh, it's optional. Okay, Jesus, I'll follow you. I'll be a little bit uncomfortable, and that'll be okay. Because as long as I follow you, as long as my heart is right, as long as my intention is right, that counts. That's like the equivalent of saying, like, good vibes. I'm sending good vibes to you, Jesus. My vibes are I want to follow you. Not really going to do this thing that makes me uncomfortable. Not going to stretch. Not going to believe that you can do anything. But I want to. Luke puts it this way when Jesus says it. If you don't want to be uncomfortable, don't bother. Jesus is still speaking really plainly to his disciples. If you want to follow me, Comfort is not the end goal. It's actually the opposite. Constant process of turning down what is easy for what will probably be challenging. It's the constant thought of what we are called to versus what we're comfortable with. We've had, um, I've had the benefit over the last few weeks of having some young pastors come and speak to the youth group. And it's been really a blessing to, to Ashley and I. I hope it's been a blessing to everybody that's heard them. But a couple of things that they've said have really struck, like, just struck me. And I felt it was confirmation from God. One of the, the young pastors, his name Stone Walden, had, had equated something as far as, listen, it's like going to the gym, right? Like, you're not going to see gains unless you put the work in. You're not going to grow unless you see discomfort. And then this other pastor, Rory Cartwright, who was here this past week, had even said, it's like, you can't get anything without giving something. And then Tuesday, it's like, it's like this happens sometimes. Pay attention, guys. When God speaks to you, he speaks to you through people. He speaks to you through his word, and they always agree. Because I went to a breakfast on Tuesday morning, and there was a man named Ed Carvin that got up there and was speaking about why did Jesus approach Peter in his boat after he'd gone all night fishing and didn't catch anything? Why did Jesus approach him then to get into the boat and go back out? Was it because Jesus needed a boat so that he could go and preach to people on the shore because the the sound would amplify over the water? Is that why he did it? No. It wasn't for Jesus' benefit to go and approach Peter while he was tired and probably a little frustrated. It was Peter's benefit that Jesus asked him to step back into what was uncomfortable to go and do something that was inconvenient because the blessing was greater in it. There's going to be pain and growth. And if we're going to follow Jesus, and make no mistake, if you ask Jesus to save you from what you are, then you're asking him to change you into what he wants you to be. If we're going to follow Jesus, it's not going to be comfortable. Taking up your cross hurts. 
You have to evaluate in your life where you're unwilling to grow. I've had the benefit of the last two years, and again, really what I'm giving you this morning is just testimony. I've had the benefit over the last couple of years to be able to be uncomfortable. To be able to, like, it's like wearing pants that are too small for you. That's a really weird analogy. It's just coming to me at the moment. Just go with it. <laughs> Pastor Barry is somewhere being like, oh, no, he's going off the, okay. It's uncomfortable wearing clothing that does not fit. Does it still accomplish a purpose? Yes. But it gets less and less comfortable the more and more you grow. And it becomes more and more obvious over time that something has to change. I promise I'm not going anywhere else with that analogy. That's the end of it. You have to evaluate in your life where you're unwilling to grow. Are these pants really going to suffice for the longest time? They are so, not these ones specifically, ones that are too small. Or am I really going to wear these for the rest of my life? Or am I ready to go ahead and step into something better, bigger, different, challenging? It's that area when you identify where it is that you're uncomfortable giving over to God, it's that area that you're probably going to need to walk. Like when you, sac- you stand and you worship God and, and you're thinking of all the things you're grateful to the Lord for, or you're thinking of things that maybe you've done incorrectly this week and you need forgiveness for, when you pinpoint the area in your life that you're not willing to change, that's exactly the place that you're supposed to step into. I'm not singling you out. Uh, this is me too. I've felt convicted when I make decisions that are half effort because it's easy. I'll admit it. My wife will admit it for me. Is sometimes it's like, yeah, I got that done. Check the box off. Because it's uncomfortable to do more than that. I can get away with this, but this is really what I'm supposed to do. I felt complicit when I give up fighting for the God-sized dreams in order to maintain like peace. Like make no mistake, the world's changing really really fast. And at some point, we're all going to have to come up against it if we're not already. And it's going to be uncomfortable. Because we may have people that, that shout in our face or call us names. Like, it's coming. It's already there everywhere else in the world. We're just the lucky ones that are the last ones that are going to get it. It's going to get uncomfortable. If you're not okay with discomfort, this is going to get really hard for you to follow Jesus. Point three, and then I'm going to give you the encouragement and the application. I promised you it was coming. Point three is this. Christ is over comfort. If we want to follow Jesus, it means that Jesus is now what is more important to us than our comfort. Paul puts it like this in his letter to the church at Philippi. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold. When he says bold, what he really means is uncomfortable. I'll really be uncomfortable for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For me, living means living for Christ. For me, what is important is not that I'm comfortable while I'm living. It's that I'm living in the uncomfortable because if I live that way, then I'm living for Christ. If I'm willing to step into the areas that make me uneasy, if I'm willing to step into the areas that are inconvenient for me, if I'm willing to step out in faith just enough, that's living. And he wraps it up by saying, and dying, dying's even better. Why does he say that? Paul's saying, my comfort's not really here living. My comfort comes in the after. My comfort should not be in anything but Christ. And the ultimate oneness that I'm going to have with Christ doesn't happen while I'm here. It happens when I'm with him. There's more to life than comfort. Jesus says it costs us comfort to get a better life. Again, if he's over comfort, this is what he says. But don't begin until you count the cost. So again, Jesus telling us in Luke, This costs something. Following Jesus is not, I submitted my life to Christ today and for the rest of my life I'm happy and nothing will ever challenge me and I will always have everything I ever need. 
My, I will be physically completely healthy all the time. And there's a lot of people that will preach this to you. There's no promise in the Bible that tells you that you will ever have everything that your flesh desires here on earth. Well, what about my heart's desire? Your heart is deceitful. Who can know it? The only time you get what your heart desires is when your heart desires Christ above all things. And you know what that makes you? Uncomfortable. He says, who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. I always think that's really funny that that's on the end there. That's the motivator. Everyone's going to laugh at you. Um, The idea of a comfortable Christian is primarily a Western idea. It costs us to follow Jesus. In the most basic terms of that, at a minimum, it should cost us our comfort, if not our lives. For those in other parts of the world, like I said, following Jesus is a physical death sentence, but they realize something that sometimes I think we get backwards here. And I say we, I'm including myself in this too, because sometimes we make decisions unconsciously. Like we're not really thinking this through. We're allowing the flesh to think and thus not aligning our thoughts with the mind of Christ. Maybe it's because we take this for granted. Maybe it's because we live in a culture that's based around comfort and convenience. I'm not really sure. Our brothers and sisters in Christ abroad understand that the physical discomfort that they experience on earth is nothing compared to the glory of eternity in the presence of God. Living spiritually free at the cost of physical death is a bargain. And we get it backwards. We see physical discomfort as an indicator of spiritual fault. I must not have enough faith. That's why this is uncomfortable. I must, this must not be God's will because it's inconvenient. I've heard somebody say, oh, well, when God closes a door, he opens a window. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes God closes the door because you need to beat your head against the door until your head fits the shape. We see mental anguish as a sign that we must not be living the right life. If it doesn't make me happy, I don't want it. If it makes me feel uneasy, no. But that's not what Scripture gives us as examples. Elijah, the prophet Elijah, lived spiritually free but a threat to his life constantly. Job, righteous before God but suffers physically, terribly, loses everything. Every single apostle, save for John, lives their lives in the service of Christ at the cost of great physical pain, isolation, and threat of death until they die. But those who seek comfort before their God-given purpose fall into the same sin and shame, and you can see it all throughout Scripture. King David seeks the comfort of Bathsheba instead of the pain of war. It's convenient for me to stay here and have a peep show from my balcony instead of going off and doing what God's commanded and called me to do, what does it give him? It gives him sin and shame in his life. And even though he repents and comes before God, it still costs Israel their nationhood. They split. They're taken into captivity. Ananias and Sapphira, if you know the New Testament, stow away their goods for the sake of profit because that's what's comfortable. I can't just sell what I have and give everything that I have. Then what will I have? I want to maintain my lifestyle. The Holy Spirit literally strikes them dead. Eve takes what's forbidden as pleasurable. Adam allows it because it's convenient and participates of a way of staying, or as a way of staying comfortable only to bring death and sin into the world. Comfort's never been the Savior that you should reach out to. As I've taught this message in somewhere like around 120 different sermons, I lost count. I I couldn't look at all of them. But I keep seeing this thread. And so we're going to ask, I think pastors ask churches this every Sunday. I hope they do. We're going to ask you to be obedient to Christ, to be obedient to the Word. What we're really asking you is this. Get used to uncomfortable. And acknowledge the fact that the comfort that you're willing to sacrifice is nothing compared to the comfort you're going to find in Christ. I realize that the Word of God speaks to the way that the Word of God speaks to us is not an easy thing. 
I'm going to ask the musicians to come at this point. As I reflect back on the last few years, what I've seen is that my, when my focus becomes my comfort, I experience frustration and pain and lack of understanding and doubt. And when I return my focus to Christ, what I experience is that God rewards and blesses us in our obedience. And I believe that that happens more so when our obedience costs us our comfort. Why is that? It's because comfort can become God if we let it. The enemy entices us with comfort. Comfort is king. We can fall into the trap of loving the known and the predictable at the expense of knowing abundant life in Christ because Christ calls us into things that require us to shed off comfort. Instead, we should seek lives of obedience in the difficult if we want to experience true comfort in our spirit. 2 Corinthians 1, it's verse 4, it says, He comforts us in all of our troubles. Not that you don't have them, but He comforts you in them. So that we can then comfort others. So if you're seeking comfort, give up what seems reasonable to you as far as comfort. Seek comfort in Christ. Why? Because we know that He's faithful to give it to us. And additionally, if we experience comfort in Christ, we then become able to comfort each other. When we're troubled, we will then be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. Later on, Paul says, we're confident that as you share in our sufferings, when you acknowledge the fact that we have to live in uncomfortable things sometimes, you'll also share in the comfort that God gives us. My life for the last few years has been dedicated to the message of hope in Christ and the hope being that we're saved from the old, wretched, mediocre lives that we came out of. The ministries that the Lord has entrusted me with have been centered on this premise that Christ saved you because he loves you, but he does not desire you to stay where you are or how you are. You were made for more than warming that seat on Sunday. Your butt doesn't belong in that seat as the only way and only fulfillment of the purpose God created you for. If you want to see greater blessing in your life, you've got to get up and get uncomfortable. you got to try something. Trying things is hard. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. Can I tell you some of the best friendships that I've ever made here in Kansas City came from really awkward conversations. And it's not even that I'm just super awkward, because I am. But like, sometimes you got to step into what's weird. And trust that God, if he's calling you there, will provide comfort to you in it. If you want to fix a relationship, it's an uncomfortable conversation sometimes. If you want to strengthen your body, you got to make your muscles uncomfortable. If you want to change the culture around you, you have to ask uncomfortable questions. If you want to become more like Jesus, you have to follow him into the uncomfortable. But where Jesus calls, he comforts. And it's this paradox, this mystery. If you want to save your life, you have to give it up. If you want joy and wisdom, you have to have discipline. Discipline and joy, don't they don't seem like they're synonyms. If you want to experience peace and transformation, you have to embrace discomfort. And Jesus summed up the conversation with a question. And it's this question that I'm, I'm going to leave you with as this last message that I share. In the story of your life, as you make decisions about how you will live that life as a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ, and when you're faced with a decision to pursue what is easy against what is from God, Jesus asks this question. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world? Your success, your comfort, your convenience. What does it benefit you if you lose your own soul? If you never step into who God called you to be? It's scary. I get it. Is anything worth more than your soul. I'm going to ask prayer partners to come. Um, if you need prayer today, if you're done living a comfortable life, if you're done saying, you know what, I've, just, I've existed in Christ, but I really want to live for Christ, then you need to pray. You need to ask God to fill you with His Spirit. You need God to show you what your next uncomfortable step is. God showed me mine. It's been a whirlwind. It's been a joyful, scary, uncomfortable, fantastic whirlwind. I could not be more grateful for the things that God has allowed me to experience here. 
things that God's allowed my family to experience here. Could not be more grateful. But I can't leave until you know that Jesus loves you and desires for you to follow him. Go into every uncomfortable place with him. Make the comfort of Christ be more important to you than anything else. And don't sacrifice who you were made to be for anything less. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you right now, Lord, that you're good, that your promises are good. God, I thank you for every good work that you do in us and through us. God, I thank you for the blessing of Tiffany Fellowship Church. Holy Spirit, I believe right now, Lord, that you're already calling people. You're already turning hearts to you. You're bringing them to Jesus, Lord. But even past that, God, that you're, you're igniting flames and, and passion within the hearts of your followers, Jesus. God, that you would give us visions and you would give us understanding of the purpose that you called us to. God, that we might live lives not of earthly comfort, but of eternal joy. God, I pray your blessing over this time. Lord, all that need prayer, God, I pray that you would provoke them by your spirit to, to seek you today. I thank you for all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come for prayer, please.